Well, hello, ladies, gentlemen, and everyone listening in to this new podcast of VORW International, the voice of the report of the week. Thank you for checking in the late February edition, 2023. Let's start it off by saying, well, better late than never. This is not going to be the longest podcast in the world, but you'll see why in a, in a little bit. Not for any bad reason, as a matter of fact, it's, it's actually for a good reason. And uh, more shows will be coming up. Really, it, this is more of an organizational approach, you could say. Just in terms of getting everything sorted out and straightened out. Now, every, everything's good, so it's going to work out for the best. Anyway, if you are tuned into this program on YouTube... First and foremost, I'd like to draw your attention over to the fan art featured in the program today. There are two pieces for this program. The first piece of fan art, give credit to Val, who also goes by Valerie3 on Instagram. That's V-A-L-O-O-R-I-3, that's the number three, on Instagram. And the second piece of fan art goes out to an anonymous listener. A little bit of a collage there promoting the 4840 kilohertz broadcast. So a big thank you to the both of you for sending in that fan art. Much appreciated. And dear listeners, if you are feeling artistically inclined, I always welcome fan art. It's something that has been a a long-standing tradition of this program for the last nine years at this point. Way to do it is very simple, of course. All you have to do is, well, have fun with it. <laughs> really, that's all that there is to it. If you feel inclined or inspired to make a piece of fan art, go for it. Have fun with it. And then it would be my absolute pleasure to feature any listener submitted fan art in the next program that I do. So just have fun with it, and all you have to do is send in the fan art submission to me via email to v-o-r-w-i-n-f-o at gmail.com, and please let me know how you would like to be credited. So let me know if you would just like to be credited by name, by name and location. You could be credited by name, and if there is a social media profile uh, you would like for me to credit where more of your work can be found, if there's a site where more of your work can be available, it's no problem at all. I'll be happy to uh, provide any of that information in the description. You put the time and effort into making these pieces of fan art, so the very least I can do is provide any interested listeners a way to find more of your work. So, just let me know how you'd like to be credited, any profiles, any websites, you name it, that you'd like for me to add. Be happy to do that. Of course, if you just want to be anonymous, that's fine too. All you have to do is let me know that you'd like to be anonymous, or... If you don't include anything, you'll just be anonymous by default. I'm not the type that's going to go and say, "Oh, well, you didn't you didn't leave anything, so I'm just going to uh see the name and your email address and I'll just use that." No, it's it's not my thing. I'm just going to I'm going to keep you anonymous in that case. So it would just be appreciated. Let me know how you'd like to be credited, but uh Again, fan art side of things, if you'd like to do it, it's just there for you to do. The next show is going to be one that's much longer than how uh, this one is going to be, so that's kind of why I'm I'm mentioning that. There will be plenty of opportunities to feature plenty of different pieces. All right, secondly, before we get into the rest of the show, this is the time where I'm going to do the shameless self-promotion, get it out of the way. The last program that I did made zero dollars and zero cents. It was demonetized completely, which is... It's not the uh, exception, it's more of the norm. And 
I'm just not the type to sit here and self-censor anymore, just such petty stuff, in my opinion, to try to appease an algorithm, uh, because as a result, I just want to let the discussions and uh, subjects covered in this broadcast be what they are, without having to sit here and make it the little, oh, the, the, the PG version of the program, when, mind you, at least as I perceive it, this is not a crude or graphic program in any way, shape, or form. I try to have a professional discussion on a variety of subjects, some of which may be a bit morbid, a bit dark. Uh, but again, I, I don't mean for this to be a vulgar program. At the same time, though, I'm not going to sit here and tiptoe around every little thing. And if there are things that I want to talk about, this is my platform to do it. And I'm not going to sit there and say, oh, forget it, I'm not going to do a show because it'll get demonetized. I'm just done with that. So, the only reason why I mention that is if you do like the show and you want to support it, sometimes I'll have emails that'll come in, they'll say, well, what platform can I listen to the show on uh, so you could make anything off of it? There, There is none. I don't make anything off of any platform at this point, so I don't care how you listen to it because nothing matters in that regard. All I will say is that if you do enjoy the show, you want to support it, this is just the time where I pass around the little tip jar and that's it. This is the only time you'll hear me say this. Any donations are welcome. You could send a donation via PayPal to V-O-R-W-I-N-F-O at gmail.com. You could donate via Patreon at patreon.com slash the report of the week. On a final note, if you'd like to purchase any merchandise for the YouTube channel or the radio show, any of that good stuff, you could find the link to that in the description, the report of the week dot creator dash spring dot com. Just a few ways to support the show, and uh, just throwing that information out there. Now, compared to the length that some of the shows I do usually are, I know that this isn't going to be the typical length. I know that this isn't going to be the long form, very long duration program. That's all right. That's all right. This program is mostly going to be a, uh, well, for lack of a better word, like a catch-up program. I just want to touch base a little bit, get a few things tended to. I actually have a few questions that anyone out there listening in is, or can feel free to send in a response to. And uh, really just organize things. I hope to do another show soon, and this is just to, again, organize things, and uh, really it'll just make everything easier. It'll make, as far as doing the show goes, it'll make it easier on my end. But on your end, as a listener, it's going to help out too, because it's going to be able to organize things, and then it's going to allow for the next program to be produced pretty quickly, I would hope, assuming all goes well. So, I don't even think this is going to be an hour. Again, I just want to organize a few things, and uh, I'll just drift from one random topic to the next. All right. First things first. I'll always mention this each year when this happens. A couple days ago, it was Monday the 20th of February, 2023, that marked an anniversary for my YouTube channel, The Report of the Week. And I now have been at it, doing these videos on YouTube, for the span of 12 years. That's right, 12 years ago, on February 20th, 
2011, I got to the camera, and I did my very first review. I, I can't believe it's been that long. I can't believe it, you know? It's... It's a good, I guess, example of time and the passage thereof, and I, I know that I haven't been around all that long in this world, but it's just crazy to think time and its passage, and I'm sure at least for some of us you can relate to this. If you think about from birth until you were 12 years of age, didn't that seem like an eternity? It seemed like it was so long. When you think about when you were a 12-year-old, and you think back, it's like those years, it just seemed far longer than 12 years. And then you go, now as an adult, you just go back 12 years, and it certainly, it just feels like yesterday, pretty much. At least that's how it feels for me. It's like, when I think of myself, and again, from birth until I was a 12-year-old, I mean, there was just so much change, and it just, it just felt a lot longer than the time span from 2011 until 2023 does. It's just funny, and I know it's just the way that it is, and Time only continues to accelerate, but I've accepted it. It's one of those things. It doesn't put me in any sort of existential crisis or anything. Look, it just is what it is. And time, it does what it does, and we simply perceive it as we do. Can't believe it's been 12 years, though. You know, there's certain things that I'll, I'll think back to in 2011, where, you know, think about some aspects of my life, and, you know, it'll be like, wow, that does feel like it was a while ago. But then there's those other moments, sometimes they could even be little subtle memories, where it's like, that just feels like it could have happened the other day. It's crazy how it is, but one thing I can tell you for sure, I never would have expected that I would still be here still doing what I do 12 years later. I never would have guessed. I never would have ever guessed that this would have been able to continue for as long as it has at the rate that it has. This was just supposed to be a little hobby, a little something that I would do Originally, it was every Sunday, and it was once a week. That's that's why I called the channel the Report of the Week. And that was going to be that. I thought I was going to wrap it up in a couple weeks, do it for the fun of it, and that was going to be that. It's just crazy. I can't believe it. But certainly, I hope to still be here, year after year, as long as... I'm around, and I have the drive and motivation and resources. You know, I'm going to keep it up. I'm, I'm not going to go anywhere. I'm still going to be doing what it is that I do, but I just never, never would have imagined that 12 years. It's just crazy. It's crazy to think. During those 12 years, there have been ups and downs, and there have been moments where have I contemplated quitting? Have I have I contemplated giving up? I sure have. Absolutely I have. There have been times where it, it came real close. One of the reasons why I never wound up throwing in the towel, even though there were those moments, like I said, where it came close. You know, there's things that that come up especially if you've never really dealt with them before. It's like, this isn't stuff that you want to, to have to go through. Be that harassment, stalking, threats, or just the, the burnout process. These aren't things, especially when you start it just as a hobby, you're not really anticipating all of this stuff to ever, ever really come to be, come to pass. So there are those moments where I think, I don't know if the 
the benefits outweigh the drawbacks anymore. I don't know if this is something that I even want to to bother with anymore, right? We've I'm sure we've had those moments before when it comes down to one thing or the other, be that a hobby or whether it's employment or, or anything, really. You think about throwing in the towel, and you know, sometimes there are those situations where walking away, maybe that is the right thing to do, maybe that is the best thing to do. Sometimes you see a you have the sinking ship, and there's that lifeboat. You can get into that lifeboat. You could save yourself. Don't have to go down with the ship. Sometimes that's the best approach to take, but sometimes there are those those instances where maybe you want to take that out. Maybe it might be easier that way. Might seem might seem like I could do that. Then I don't have to worry about this. But sometimes. Could be that short-term reprieve, but long-term it might be worth it to, to weather the storm. You know, every situation is different. Every situation has its own individual qualities and aspects and characteristics. And and that's only something that you can discern yourself. When you have that unique perspective of of whatever it is you might be going through... Only you can look at it, and you could come to that decision or that realization. Do I want to stick with it? Or is it time to walk away? And there were those instances where I had to ask myself that. I had to look at the channel, and even the radio side of things, too. That's come with its own problems. And think... Do I want to keep this up, or or do I want to stop it? Sometimes it's an easy choice. Sometimes the answer is right there in front of you. Sometimes you really got to sit and and think about it. And over those 12 years, I've had those moments, like I said, more than once, where I've sat down and had to think about it. There were those moments all the way back in 2011 when... Some of the people at the time in my school, they certainly got their their laughs in regards to the channel. Of course they did. And uh, it was a source of harassment by some of the, the bullies in the school. Not afraid to admit that. That was just the reality. There were times in 2013, 2014, when I was harassed incessantly by... A lot of online trolls. There were those instances in 2016 that I was stalked. And the list goes on and on. And Yeah, there are those times, sit down, and you think, maybe just pull the plug, right? If I get rid of it, then these problems will very likely come to an end. And that's a good thing, isn't it? Less stress, less strain less things to worry about a big a big source of of frustration stress anxiety could even be depression in in your life right that's gone now but there's the flip side of the coin usually and the flip side of the coin because you're right those those sorts of aspects were all there with this channel it was there were these times where it had its problems that that came along with it. Still are. But like I said, it's not just that solely. It's that flip side. When I see the comments and the emails and the wonderful people that this channel and these broadcasts that I do reach from all around the world, when I get these emails, even if, to me personally, they they can sometimes be hard for me to believe, I can see the sincerity in them about how the videos that I do or the broadcasts that I make, how they're able to help so many people in so many ways. And it's it's unbelievable to me. Not that I don't believe what these folks are telling me, but it's it's unbelievable that 
anything I could ever do could ever have any sort of impact on anyone. I I just can't imagine that, you know. I'm I'm sitting here right now, you know, I'm I'm me. I'm nothing special. It's How does me saying or doing something, how does that help anyone? But when I see that it does, it just, it never gets old. It's not one of those things where it's been 12 years and it's just, yeah, yada, yada, yada. It still blows me away. After all these years, it's still something that I just, I'm not used to. But when I see that, it really touches me and it, it sometimes can be a lot to process. Because like I said, it's just not something that I ever expect myself to do. Or to have, or the fact that what I do can even help a single person out there. I don't expect that. But it gives me some extremely valuable perspective. And when I see that, and how I feel when I see it, truly it gives me the motivation and the inspiration, despite whatever sort of hardship may come along with this, me personally, it gives me that motivation to keep doing what I do for the 12 years that I've been doing it. So to all those of you out there listening in, I just want you to give yourself a pat on the back, because I will tell you this right now, if it weren't for you, this anniversary wouldn't be here. This channel wouldn't be here. I would have stopped it, and I would have shut it down probably in May of 2011, because that was the first time that I had that sort of feeling of self-doubt. I was ready. I was ready to shut it down right then and there. So, I just want you to know that. If it weren't for you out there tuned in, listening into this, you are the reason why this is still here, why it's been here for 12 years, and why I certainly hope it will be here for 12 more years, or 20, or however many years this is around for. Give yourself a pat on the back. Give yourself a round of applause, because you, the viewer, the listener, you deserve it. And I just want you to know that. What a crucial role you play in all of this. And I just sincerely want to give you my gratitude. And to anyone out there who has aspirations to want to do something in terms of creating content or pursuing an interest... It's a tough world, and the environment for creating content and doing something online is very different now than it was back in 2011. It's, it's tougher, it's gotten more difficult, it's highly competitive, and I just, I don't know what role AI is going to have in the future, but... I encourage you, no matter what, if you have that drive, if you have that spark, if you have that interest, give it a shot. Give it a shot. Whether that's seriously trying to pursue that interest, or if you just kind of want to dip a toe in and test the waters out, Try it. When I first started doing these reviews, I didn't know how it was going to go over. I didn't know if I was going to like it or hate it or, or how it was going to be. After I filmed that first review, you know what I was thinking? I was thinking, wow, this is, this was fun. I enjoyed doing this. And it's like the first review that I did, it, it did have some issues. A couple... Years ago, I found the footage 
where uh, the video was was filmed the wrong way initially, and I had to redo it. And that was a source of frustration, but, you know, even after it, I, I felt good. I was like, wow, I had a fun time doing this, and... Then I remember when I did the second review, that really cemented it. And it was like, I could... I was getting into the swing of things even then, and I was thinking to myself... This is fun, you know? I I like this. It's like my own little little show, and I can... Review these energy drinks and goof around a little bit while I'm doing it. And it's, it's just something that I can make my own and uh, have a good time doing it. And that's what I did. My personal advice, <clears throat> because as I said, it's very competitive. Do something because it's what you want to do and are having a fun time doing. If you do something strictly with the expectation that I'm going to get attention and I'm going to get money and this, that, and the other thing, it's going to get old real fast. And if those expectations aren't met, it's going to hurt. Cliché it may be, there's truth to it. Just be yourself. Be yourself. Have fun, be genuine, and if you enjoy doing what it is that you do, you can reasonably do so, then don't give up. You never know where it's going to take you. When I was doing this, this wasn't... This was just something that I was doing on the weekends. It's just a hobby. It was just something that I was doing purely for the fun of it. I never thought that this was ever going to be any sort of livelihood for me in the slightest. So you never know where this will take you. You have to realistically look at the odds, what they may be, but you just don't know. You don't know until you try. So I just want to give you a little bit of encouragement. Give it a shot, and like I said, look, you just, you never know what's going to happen. Celebrating 12 years of the report of the week. All right, these are two questions that came to mind. Usually one question is is more than enough, but you know what? Let's just go for it. Let's just do two questions. Just discussion questions. I'm going to throw them out there, and if you want to send in a response, all you have to do is uh, write me an email. V O R W I N F O at gmail dot com. That's the address to send it to, and then I'll read your response in the next program. I do want to to mention that let's say since the last show or even before it, if you just had a random email with questions, topic suggestion, anything you wanted to share, etc. All I ask is that you could resend it, or you could even just reply to the original email. Just bump it back up. That way I know which emails to get to for the next show, where there's still some interest. And uh, just go for it from there. So if you've sent in an email in the last few months, just a random email for the show, and you haven't heard it covered here, I'm just asking, just bump it back up. You could resend it. You could forward it to me. Again, you could just reply to the original email with any, I mean, anything you want. But it's such an easy process. It could have been done several times over, even just in the span that I've been ex- explaining this. So it's very easy to do. If you've sent in an email again, just bump it back up, and I will get to it in the next program that I do. Like I said, that's another reason I was mentioning just so that I could help organize things on my end and I can get the next show out far more quickly because the inbox that I have is used for this podcast as well as the radio show that I do. And I get many, many emails. And since 
the last time I've done a full-blown mailbag show was back, gosh, must have been in December or so. As a result, there are so many emails that have come in since that point that it's just hard to organize and it's hard to figure out, okay, what's what? When was this? Have I read it already? Have I not? Etc. So, if there's an email that you sent in uh, in the past and I just haven't gotten around to it, like I said, now's the time to just bump it up. Don't feel bad about doing so. I'm, I'm actively encouraging you to do it. Uh, that way I can get to some of the emails that I might have missed in the past that might just be lost in the in the sea of other uh, messages that are there. So please do that if you would like. All right, that said, here are two questions for the next show. And uh, just share your thoughts accordingly. Take any position you want. I don't care. And uh, you'll be credited however you want to be credited. Just let me know in the email. But... uh, Here are some things I was thinking about. So the first discussion topic for the next show that I'm I'm interested in responses for. So, I mean, I review the damn stuff to begin with. And granted, I'll be speaking in generalizations here because I know there are chains that are outliers. But, you know, when it comes down to fast food, I mean, I see this. I'm sure you see it. Maybe you feel this way. But if you mention a chain, you could pick a chain, any chain, McDonald's, Burger King, Wendy's, Taco Bell, Pizza Hut, you usually get a very familiar sentiment each time. And that's, yeah, McDonald's, well, they used to be so much better back in the 90s, right? Or Taco Bell, yeah, they were... I wish you could have experienced it back in the 80s, you know, it was really something else. Or uh, Pizza Hut, yeah, it's just not the same anymore. The quality's just gone downhill so much. Now, some people say, oh, these people are just blinded by uh, nostalgia, etc. But even I feel that there has been a decline. Like I said, I review this stuff. I know that the quality of these items and the establishments themselves have gone downhill in recent years. I feel that they have declined precipitously, especially since COVID, but they've been on a downhill track for a while. I feel like the price has increased and the quality has decreased. The consistency has decreased. And sometimes you'll be paying all of this money for a subpar meal, and it's like, it didn't used to be this way. What's even the point? I'll give a good example. I remember, even with Taco Bell, one of the first times I ever went to Taco Bell was in the early 2000s. And, you know, it's funny, I didn't even get a beef taco. I got a chicken taco. And let me tell you, it was pretty darn good. It was fresh. It was enjoyable. And the quality of it, like I said, was surprisingly good. So then about 20 years later or so, I just remembered that memory, right? I was just a real little kid. I remembered how good it was. So now you do that time jump into the future and... It's just one of the, it's one of those random things that came back to me, and I thought, oh yeah, I remember. I remember how much I liked that chicken taco from Taco Bell. Thought, how about for old time's sake, I get it again. You know, see if it's as good as I remember it being. So, I ordered it, I got it, and it was this slimy slop that looked like someone cracked open a can of cat food dumped it into a tortilla and uh, put some completely stale lettuce on top of it and uh, bon appetit. It's disgusting. It was horrible and it was disgusting. And I thought, wow, this this is not 
how I remember it being at all. This was inedible. And you hear time and time again, one account after the next after the next. It was better in the 80s, it was better in the 90s, it was even better in the 2000s. Establishment after establishment after establishment. And I do think that there is a trend where there is an agenda to give you less for more. So the question that I have for you is this. What do you think the end game is as far as fast food goes? By that I mean, what do you think going forward, be that 10 years from now, 20 years from now, 30 years from now, however far in the future you want to take it, where do you think all this is going to land? Do you think the quality is just going to get worse and worse and worse? And the price is going to get higher and higher and higher? And everyone's just going to sit there and accept it? Do you think that there is going to be a pushback? And the customers will eventually stand up and say, Enough is enough. I've been screwed over for so long, I'm not going to take it anymore. And people are going to protest with their pocketbooks. And these businesses are going to be forced to change if they want to survive. Do you think that all these places are just going to go out of business eventually? Do you think that this is an agenda that's being perpetrated by higher powers to just get people to eat insects? Do you think that there really is no decline and that we're all just imagining this? Some people, I'm sure, think that. I don't, but... Some people, maybe you do. And I'd be interested in hearing that too. But generally speaking, and there are always those chains that buck the trend. And I'm taking that into account. But generally speaking, when you look at the state of fast food, and this is purely in regards to fast food, not fine dining and not local establishments, but we're talking McDonald's, Burger King... Taco Bell, Pizza Hut, those sorts of places. You see the sentiment, they've gone downhill, and they're not really getting any better. So what do you think's going to happen? What do you think the future holds for all these establishments? Is it going to reach a point where it's just going to stabilize and plateau, and this, that's going to be that? Do you think it's going to swing back around and get better? Do you think, maybe you disagree, maybe you think it is getting better and it's the best it's ever been? You think they're all going to uh, go out of business? You think they're being ordered from the government to be this way? What do you see this turning into? So your feedback on that is welcome to V O R W. I-N-F-O at gmail.com. Take it any way you want to take it. That's what it's there for. All right, the second one is just something I've been thinking about. There was, in February, one of the worst natural disasters, in my opinion... in the 21st century the earthquake that happened in Turkey and Syria the amount of destruction caused by this earthquake unprecedented and the death toll massive Over 50,000 deaths at this point, and that number is only expected to increase. There was a magnitude 7.8 earthquake, was followed by an aftershock of 7.7. This is incredibly powerful shaking that we're talking about here. 
Thankfully, there was no major tsunami, but that's the only thing you could really say. There were so many buildings that went down in that part of the world. Thousands and thousands and thousands of high-rise buildings and... Again, the, the death toll, the injuries, the destruction. It's, it's unfathomable. And it's unprecedented. I'm sure you've all heard about this in the news quite a bit. I covered it on the shortwave extensively. And it's something that I've been monitoring. There were a lot of things that came together, unfortunately, that made the situation pretty much as bad as it could be, but on the subject of earthquakes, since it's something that we've probably been hearing a lot about this month in the news, and you've seen a lot of discussion regarding, I want to ask the question, and it's purely, of course, if you feel comfortable doing so, have you ever been in an earthquake? If so, what is the worst earthquake you have ever experienced. Take the question however you want to take it. Elaborate however you want to. Share whatever you'd like to share. But essentially, if you've experienced an earthquake, what is the worst earthquake you have ever experienced? It could just be something where you just noticed everything kind of rattling around a little bit. It's nothing, nothing more than that. It could be a devastating earthquake. could have been the one that hit in Japan back in 2011. could have been the 2004 Indian Ocean earthquake and tsunami. could be, again, it could be anything. But if you've ever been in an earthquake and you have a story to tell, uh, feel free to take it any way you want. If you just want to talk about anything earthquake-related, uh, it's your platform to do so. You could send in responses to either of these questions. V O R W I N F O at gmail.com. With that, let's take a look at some of the feedback that's come in. Let's take a look. Let's see what we have. What I'd like to do next is uh, get to a few pieces of feedback that uh, deal with the toilet paper situation in regards to the COVID. Of course, I mentioned that uh, I was taking any responses in regards to that, and uh, a few came in, actually, so let's get to them. All right. Let's start... Let's start right here. Sue Ann, listening in from... Birmingham, Alabama, to Ribera, New Mexico, who says, Hello. I think the Americans that remember watching live on TV the Ninth Ward residents relocate to the Superdome as a result of Hurricane Katrina saw thousands of folks without toilet paper, food, or water, or even the buses that were promised that never came for over a week knew the fear and struggle in real time. So when the shelves emptied and food supplies were at risk during the beginning of the pandemic, it was a visceral response. Many recent decades and generations remember food shortages and stock market crashes. It's very real and perhaps unfamiliar to today's youth. They barely remember 9-11. I ordered some toilet paper from Amazon in March and received it in August. I saved a roll as a souvenir because the proportion of toilet paper to cardboard core was 0.25 inch thickness of paper to 3 inch core. So uh, thank you for checking in there. It's an interesting approach to it, but uh, I can see where you're coming from that some folks may have seen some things uh, that happened in the past, and maybe to themselves they thought, I'm not going to repeat that mistake again. It's an interesting take. Thanks for sharing it. 
It sounds, though, like you were reasonable, at least. I mean, everyone can certainly say, oh, anyone who bought uh, toilet paper back then contributed to it, but to me, it sounds like you just bought a reasonable amount, and uh, you didn't go out and buy enough for, you know, an entire apartment building full of people or anything like that. Ike in Minnesota says, This is a response to your question. Unfortunately, my family didn't listen to the warning, and we were ones that were left scrambling to various retail establishments for just one precious square of toilet paper to bring home. What it seemed to me, for the reason of hoarding, was the probability of getting a premium price, reselling it on various websites like Craigslist. Just a thought. Thanks for your show. So thanks, Ike, in Minnesota, with your toilet paper thoughts. You know, the reselling is another good point that uh, is raised. I remember one thing that got resold like crazy early on, and then they cracked down on it, and uh, that was that. But I remember that masks, especially N95 masks, you should have, if you if you weren't looking, you should have seen what those things got upcharged for, back in uh, back in like January, February, and maybe March of 2020. I mean, forget it. You would, there were people selling just two N95 masks for like 50 bucks, but and people people paid that much for them, because at the time they were saying, well, if you, you know. There were so many what-ifs about COVID at the time, so when there was still that realistic uh, view that maybe this is a a, a contagion that is going to wipe out a lot of society, then so what? What's $50 to buy something that may very well uh, keep you alive while everyone else around you dies? So people were willing to pay the uh, premium for it. Now... I remember early on in, you know, 2020, I got into the mask thing thing and all of that. I got into the mask thing. <laughs> I'll get in trouble for saying this, but I don't care. Back when they were telling you not to wear them and uh, when you would get the dirty looks for wearing the mask and people would recoil and they would say they would say I don't want to get sick from you you're you're, you're wearing the mask and you're going to get sick so you're sick you're wearing one now I'm not I'm not going to get sick from from you I don't want to be around you oh don't don't wear it right that's um they said not to wear one I'm sure I sound like a deranged lunatic laughing at that, but so be it. I just, you know, it just changes. It is what it is. It's it's how it all is. But uh, I still can't... (laughs) I still can't get over the 180 that society in general did. I'm not, you know, saying that it's a... It's just how it was. And, uh... There were some people that were saying society is going to forget the majority of the COVID, and that's a good thing. You ever notice in the media these days that gets tacked on a lot, and that's a good thing. Whenever I see something worded as overtly as that, I can't help but think, why do they need to tell me that that's a good thing? It's like they're trying to put that concept in people's heads. And, you know, then I I can't help just the way I am when it comes down to media and all of that. If I ever see that, I think, is it then? If they're telling me what to think before I even read it, you know, why? Why are they? Is it really a good thing, or is that just, want, is that just what people with various motives want me to think? And, you know, sometimes I'll do some digging, and then it turns out that the thing that they say is a good thing. 
yeah, really is at least what I would consider to be a good thing. But then other times I'll do some research and then I'll think to myself, yeah, it's, it's no wonder why they're trying to tell everyone what to think before they even know all the details. Yeah, <laughs> that makes sense now. So it's just, it's variable. But um, I just can't say I'm a phrase of that verbiage. I mean, I guess there are instances where that's what they need to tack in there, but it just comes off as very forced to me, I guess, for lack of a better word. But, you know, there's nothing new with that. Anyway, there was a... I remember there was an article that I saw that said most people will you know, forget everything about the pandemic or something like that. And they said, and that's a good thing. And I think to myself, is it a good thing? You say it is, but is it? Just because you say that it is and your headline doesn't make it true. I don't know. I don't think that's a good thing. I think a lot of people need to remember all of it. And uh, realize the right end the wrong that was done. We'll never get any better if we don't learn from our mistakes, but sadly that's not something that we do, so it's uh, it's fruitless and useless at this point. But nonetheless, early on, and like I said, I just can't help but, I, I just can't help but kind of, yeah, cynically in a way, I guess, laugh. But like I said, it's, it was just how it was back then. I can't help but find the 180 just funny to me, that's all. When um, early on I was getting all the masks and stuff, when they were still available, when you could still go to a, a Walmart or a Lowe's or a Home Depot, go to the, uh, you know, the renovation or the, the remodeling or like the home repair section or even the paint section... And uh, you could find some N95 masks. So I got a bunch from there. And I was one of those people early on that if I had to go out, I would go and uh, walk around with the N95 on back when they said not to wear a mask. You know, it is what it is, but... Based on my understanding of the situation, I thought, you know, I thought, not going to risk it. So that was the approach I took back then. But, you know, that was just based on the information I had available to me, which then changes with time. Everyone else was acting on the information that they were presented, and uh, they were told by the powers that be that you can't wear one, so they didn't. It is what it is. It's... That's how it goes for a lot of things. It's not just masks or not, but... Anyway, I remember even after a week or two after I kind of got them, I thought, wow, I can't believe how much these are going for. No, I thought, there's no way I'm... I'm selling mine to make a quick buck. I thought, again, I thought, I'm going to need these. But I did think... Wow, I wish... If I could even just go back in time a few weeks, I wish I could have gone to all these stores and just bought thousands of these and just started selling them, even at an upcharged price that wouldn't even be unreasonable. It would be, you know, $20 cheaper than the competition, so it wouldn't necessarily be highway robbery, but I couldn't help but think to myself, imagine that, I could make, I could make so much doing that, which some people did. Not the, not the time traveling part, but the the upcharging. Yeah. I don't know if you could actually say dramatically fortunes were made by reselling toilet paper and masks, but who knows. Anyway, just remember that. The N95s and that weird time. Yeah, but it is what it is. This next email comes in from Tab, who writes... I was listening to the podcast and would like to suggest another reason for the hoarding of supplies. I recall during early to mid-2020, my boyfriend's brother had told us that there would be lockdowns in which we would be confined to our houses for weeks, possibly months at a time. We thought he had some special inside knowledge, being that he works at the hospital, 
I was never one to hoard toilet paper, hand sanitizer, nor food. I did, however, buy a week worth of food, rather than my typical day at a time back then, for several reasons. To avoid big crowds in stores, not have to make frequent trips, should the stores run short on supplies. Mostly bought canned beans and shelf-stable foods for later consumption. Hope this helps. So thank you, Tab, for checking in there. Yeah, those reasons make sense to me, and, uh... That's another thing. It's like... At the time, you obviously didn't have a crystal ball, so you didn't know what exactly... Number one, the situation would hold... And number two, what exactly would the restrictions be? Right? You didn't know. So, to me, when I stocked up on stuff, I did it for a lot of the same reasons. Now, I didn't stock up on the toilet paper, you know, but mostly like, well, like you said, tinned foods or, you know, canned foods and all that sort of stuff. Same exact things. And just in case, I wouldn't really be able to go out. If everything was shut down, be that due to government mandate, or be that everyone was dead, or at least enough people were dead that things couldn't operate as uh, as they would before things would, you know, get any better or what have you, then... Uh, made sure I had plenty of ways to eat. Now, another reason why it didn't really bother me, because I do like to abide in certain cases by the better safe than sorry approach, there's plenty of other reasons to uh, stock up on things, too. Uh, you could just look at all the craziness in the world, and that could be enough. Or you could look at more practical things. You could think, okay, well, for instance... In Florida, there's a risk of hurricanes. It's good to have some supplies for that. So there you have it. If you don't want to try to justify the, the COVID stuff, then that's good enough, too. But anyway, so I remember, you know, getting all of, the, getting all of those goods. I made a few trips. And uh, another reason was I figure once this spreads more, I just don't really want to find myself at the grocery store, if I could avoid it. So, I went over to Walmart back when they were 24 hours, and made a few trips at 3 a.m., got stocked up, and that was fine. That's all I needed to do. That's another sad thing that went away with COVID that's never coming back, a lot of the good 24-hour stuff. All right, this uh, email comes in from an anonymous listener. Mentions. I did not hoard toilet paper in 2020, but my parents did. My mother had about 200 rolls in total when I visited. So there were definitely many who were far worse. I never asked her directly why she did it when I was home at that time, but she was bold enough to volunteer her reasoning. She feared that, as a result of other people hoarding toilet paper, there would be a shortage, so every household needed a contingency. This may not be a very dramatic answer, and my speculation is that those who started the trend were attempting to make money off of the speculation, and the masses followed after seeing videos posted online. So thank you, anonymous listener checking in. Yeah, that makes sense. I think a lot of the folks, not, you know, this is just how it is, that um, I think a lot of folks also didn't and probably still don't realize that it eventually... But then again, you'll never get a level of unity, ever. It's my belief, anyway. Purely my belief that it could ever be avoided at this point. We're just so disjointed these days that it doesn't really matter. But uh, it becomes a bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy if you think, all right, maybe there's going to be a shortage, so I have to then stock up on it 
if there's a shortage, then I'll be all right, but not really realizing that by stocking up, you are contributing to any potential of there being a shortage, and uh, people inadvertently cause that shortage when they're trying to prepare for it, and that's how the shortage actually gets caused. That's why if you ever want to prepare for something, you got to do it gradually over time, if you can, little by little, bit by bit, a little bit here, a little bit there. It's easier in terms of making sure you've got everything covered. It's easier on the wallet as well. And uh, it just works better that way. You could usually get what you need. Taking into account certain things have certain availabilities at certain times. Oh, look at this. This is exactly what we were talking about. Ashton in Georgia checking in with these thoughts. This, I mean, I just randomly clicked on this one because I'm just going through all the, the emails I see that mention toilet paper. And it just so happens that just by coincidence, this mentions the exact thing I was talking about. So, you right. I wanted to share my thoughts about the toilet paper shortage during COVID. I believe the whole situation could be used as an example of what happens when people panic unnecessarily. Really, everyone panicked because everyone else was panicking. Everyone was buying more because everyone else was buying more. When my own mom went to the store and saw the nearly empty shelves, she definitely bought a few extra packs herself. Not what I'd consider hoarding, but just a little extra, because the empty shelves looked like proof of the shortage everyone was talking about. So the fear of a shortage actually manifested a shortage. I feel that this shortage could have happened with any product. It's kind of amusing that it happened with toilet paper, I believe, theoretically, a social experiment could be conducted about a sock shortage, and you would get the same response. Socks are pretty essential, but you don't really think much about them. People would probably begin panic buying any product if they thought it might not always be available on the shelves when they want it. I feel that in a hundred years, COVID in general and the effects it had on society will be a very interesting topic for students of psychology. Thanks, Ashton, in Georgia, checking in. I just had to laugh a little bit, just the thought. But I agree completely. I, I believe it, too. I think, you name it, if the conditions are ripe, it will happen. But the thought of people fighting over, over socks, it just makes me laugh, but... Then again, who would have thought you would have videos of people fighting over rolls of toilet paper? If you said that a few years before COVID, people would laugh at you and they'd say, you're crazy. But it happened. So, there you have it. Mac in Richmond, Virginia, writing in regards to the toilet paper, I lived with someone who was one of the people who bought as many paper products, medicine, and vitamin C as possible. We would shop together as grocery pickup was a mess in our city. I got to see it firsthand. From what he's told me about his mindset during the time, he had a massive fear of missing out. Basically, he thought that if others were buying so much, he didn't want to be, quote, caught with his pants down, unquote, uh, with regards to not being able to get them. Well, I eventually bought us a bidet, and he stopped buying toilet paper. Thanks, Mac, in Richmond, Virginia. Yeah, psychologically speaking, I, I could see that too. I bet that played a big role for some folks, the fear of missing out. They thought, well, that, that happens with a lot of things. Again, everyone else is doing it, and uh, surely they must be doing it for a reason, and, uh, no, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to miss out on that. I don't want to get left behind. Let's take a look at one more email about the toilet paper situation. You mentioned the toilet paper craze of 2020 in a previous broadcast, and asked if there were any listeners who partook in the craziness. Well, Here's my story. 
So it was early 2020 and I was closely monitoring the virus as it jumped from country to country. Once I f- once it found its footing in the Netherlands, where I reside, that's when my anxiety went up through the roof. I really thought that a second black death was upon us. Not too long after that, the toilet paper craze started showing up in the news. My mind was clearly in panic mode, as can be read in an email that I sent to you at that time. Here is part of that email that I wrote in March of 2020, and I'll I'll read this excerpt that you included. And it reads, quote, So this is now going back in time, so let's pretend we're back in the glory days of March 2020. As you know, I live in the Netherlands, and like in many other countries, the coronavirus has found its way into our part of the world, and it's spreading like wildfire. 24 hours ago, we had 38 cases, and it's now gone up to 82. I personally feel a lot of anxiety about all the current events surrounding the virus, and I'm sure you might feel the same way. People in Australia are buying toilet paper in bulk, and recently people in Europe started doing the same. Do you think I should buy some as well before the stores run out, or am I overreacting? So that was written in uh, March 2020. So now going back to the present. So during the time of writing that email, I was still on the fence about actually going out and getting some. However, a few days later, after seeing countless videos of people fighting over toilet paper and empty shelves in stores around the world, I caved in, grabbed my car keys, put on the mask, and went out to the store. I was preparing for the worst. People fighting, empty shelves, you name it. My plan was to go in, grab a couple of big packs, and head out as quickly as possible. Not going to make eye contact or touch anyone, just come in for it, be done with it. Once arriving at the store, I marched in and went straight to the toilet paper aisle. Once entering said aisle, I stopped dead in my tracks, and I could not believe my eyes. All the shelves were packed with toilet paper. No one was fighting. No empty shelves. Everything was as it's supposed to be. And I just stood there in disbelief. What was I thinking? So eventually I came to my senses and thought, why would I even need packs of toilet paper? Chances are higher I would run out of food long before I use up a hundred toilet rolls. And if push comes to shove, I could always use a magazine like they do in the movies. So I laughed at myself, bought the smallest pack of toilet paper as a joke, and went back home. I guess in the end, the main reason what drove me to take action and go to the store was all the craziness I saw online. I really thought I was going to miss the boat if I didn't act quick. I guess I got carried away at the time. The mind works in mysterious ways. That was a message from Dan in the Netherlands. So thank you for your thoughts there. I thought you had some really interesting perspective. It was it was a pleasure to read, and I like especially that you included that direct excerpt from back in early 2020, right? So that way, you could get that direct look at the thought process. Isn't that something, right? You go over to the the supermarket, and you think, am I going to have to step over a dead body? (laughs) You know, are, are there going to be toilet paper rolls on the shelves, but they're all going to be just soaked red with blood from all the fighting? Uh, to get the rolls, you know, it's like this gets carried away, and uh, I'm glad it went. I'm glad it went as smoothly as possible. So, I appreciate you sharing that. And uh, yeah, when it seems when it seems like it's so crazy, you think, "Am I ever going to be able to get the toilet paper? Right? Is it ever coming back?" It really is the uh, the hysteria. I think, I think it was craziest in some parts of the U.S., but it did become a bit of a global phenomena. 
Again, thank you, Dan, for sharing that. Well, is there anything else worth talking about? I don't really believe so. I'm just looking around right now. I was looking in the news on the subject of COVID. It says, Energy Department finds COVID-19 most likely emerged from a lab leak, reports say. Since we're talking about COVID, you know, it's an interesting headline there. Here's my take, I think, on the origin of COVID. You could say whatever you want, and it's never going to be proven. It's never going to be. I don't think there is ever going to be a conclusive, 100% guaranteed, irrefutable answer that this was COVID, this is where it came from, that's it. I just don't think you're ever going to get that, so... To be honest, say whatever you want, and uh, your guess is as good as anyone else's, because I think there are going to be a few little crumbs here and there, but it's just not going to be enough to ever put the, put the pieces together. Me, personally, uh, you know, I've been leaning for years toward the uh, lab leak theory, but if you say, well, why prove it, right? I can't. I can't prove that just a gut feeling. I just, I don't know, it just seems most likely to me. Doesn't mean that it was a bioweapon, it just means maybe they were screwing around in a lab, maybe it could be as simple as someone just didn't exercise the proper protocols, and uh, that's what happened. You know, could be just that, could just be the ultimate screw-up. I don't know. This is all speculative, but uh, that's certainly possible. Could it have been something that emerged naturally in the wild? Sure. I just don't think we're ever going to get any proof of of either of these completely. Again, it's going to be, you know... Well, I think it's this. I think it's that. And that's as far as it's going to ever get. You know, in the end, it's here. It's had its repercussions on the world, and that's all that there really is to it. But, uh, <laughs> that reminds me of this one video I saw back in 2020. Because, you know, there are a lot of viruses that come from bats. And there was a video that I saw. Let me see if I could find it. Some guy... It's a very specific video at that. <laughs> I wouldn't advise... I mean, look, if you really want to watch it, go for it. It was this guy who did this, like, travel... Travel vlog series. He wasn't... wasn't like a television show. It was just a guy doing YouTube stuff. And it was like in an educational context, you know, it was like, I think, I think he was like a pilot or something, so he would wind up in a variety of locations around the world. And in one of them, it wasn't in China, mind you, he was in Palau, which isn't anywhere even remotely close to China. But I remember he was... The video that was published in uh, late 2019, and he was sitting there eating... eating a bat. And the video was not well received, I'll tell you that. The video was not well received. He must have had thousands of comments saying that's the, that's the index case of COVID right there. 
I mean, obviously it wasn't. This was months before, and this guy was in Palau, but it certainly had its risks, and, uh... And either way, it's not like the bat was alive or anything. The thing was very much dead, but it, it wasn't very... Oh, I wouldn't eat the thing. It was, uh... Pretty much a bat. It looked like it was just a bat that, you know... Was flying one minute, and then dropped dead, and then you put it in a pan, and uh, put a little bit of sauce over it, and that's it. So, th it was not gourmet or any of that. It had the hair on it, and everything. Uh, it had th the guts in it. It was filled with uh, the fecal matter, you name it, and, uh, you know... The poor guy, he shouldn't have done the video if he really didn't want to. He, I guess he felt like, oh, you know, I wanted to showcase the uh, the island culture or whatever, you know. He, again, he was trying to do this in, in an educational context. But you could tell so that he so badly did not want to eat this thing because it looked grotesque. And I wouldn't have ever eaten that thing. But, uh, it did not look like it was prepared with care at all. Like I said, the thing still had the hair on it, and still had the gut. It was just, again, it's like if a bat just dropped a dead right out of the sky, and you just grabbed it, put it in the pan, and then, uh, we're expected to just start chowing down on it. Would you eat that? <laughs> so, uh, that's what it looked like, and, uh, you know, he, he eventually tried a piece, but... It was like he had the bare minimum, you know? He didn't just go in and just started eating it like a chicken wing or something. He cut off the tiniest, tiniest little sliver of meat that he could, and then he had a can of Coca-Cola next to him, and he kind of maybe ate half of this tiny little morsel to begin with and quickly washed it down. I mean, you know, it's probably edible. It's like... I would be willing to, to imagine that the bat meat is probably edible. I also imagine that the imagery has a lot to do with it. It's like if, if you just served up the meat and it was cooked and it you weren't even told what it was. It had a nice garnish and it was included with something else. And, uh, and there was no association whatsoever with bats. I think that a good number of people would eat it. And maybe they might say, oh, this meat tastes funny. I mean, who knows? Someone might think, oh, yeah, it tastes, uh, this is chicken, right? It's, it might be misidentified as something else. Or maybe not. Maybe it has a flavor of its own. I, I really have no idea. But I think the imagery has a lot to do with it. I think if it was served as, like, a restaurant-quality dish, it would have been easier to eat. Still, I wouldn't have eaten it. That's just me. I'm just... I, it's just not my thing. But I think more people would be inclined to. Whereas when you're looking at the bat and you're looking at it and its teeth are out and you, you see the wings spread on the plate and all of this, it's just... It's going to be a major turn-off for a lot of people. And, uh... Yeah, I remember that. Like I said... Could the COVID have come from just someone eating a bat or, or getting bitten by a bat or something? I don't know. Yeah, sure. Maybe it came from a lab. Maybe it came from a bat. I, we'll never know. Originally, I think, I thought maybe it was some sort of contaminated food or something because of the, the wet market. But then it was... That's just where the first super spreader event was. Wasn't necessarily where it originated. This is the first, again, the first super spreader event. So it was just the right place, right time. I don't, I don't think it actually had anything to do with the wet market. It's more of just a locale for it to occur. Anyway, that's all that I have for you in today's program. Thanks for listening in. Remember the questions that, uh, I asked earlier on in the program, and if you have any other random feedback, you're welcome to send that in, and if there's any random feedback that you'd like to bump back up, 
you're welcome to do that too. So the next program that I do is going to have some extensive discussion on those questions. I'll get to some random emails too, and this is going to be a fun show. That's my uh, goal for it. And please remember, I just want to have an open, unfiltered discussion. So as a result, I'm not going to be sitting here trying to censor everything just so I can make a couple bucks on YouTube. Just remember the ways to support the program that I mentioned at the beginning, and understand that's all that this show has in terms of any finances. Uh, So just take that into account. All right, that's all that I have for you. Thank you for listening, and I hope you have a great rest of your day and a wonderful remainder of February. Hopefully a pleasant March as well. That's all that I have for you. Until next time, be safe, be healthy, and I wish you all your very <laughs> and I wish you all the very best. Take care. This is VORW.